they went, they struggled to get black and paralyzed. People, some of them died of drug overdoses. Not out of no glamour that you make money off of or in a movie. It was just life. And I had so much respect and love for them and the fact that they were being that serious in an environment that nobody cared about, that I, I wanted to be like them. And even to this day, now they all have passed away. I still carry that. I carry the knowledge of just how much they believed in the music for no apparent. Then when I became in high school, when I was 12 or 13, I joined the funk band. Man, we had people at every gig we played. A thousand people, 50, people dancing. I go to my daddy's gig to me. <laughs> I start teasing him. Damn, but look at all these people. We got to look at your gig. And he was saying, yeah, but y'all can't play. <laughs> okay, so. That's my, that was, a, that's my, was my thing, and it remains my thing, to see people dedicated to something that there was no real tangible reward for. I wanted to be a reward for them in terms of my daddy. I'm like, look, man, y'all didn't waste y'all time on me, okay? I've, I've practiced, I'm going to stay serious till the day I die about this. And, and I hope and pray that I, I, that I will remain serious and actually become more humble as I get older. And that's what I work on. All right, I just want to push you on of course. <laughs> See, I'm before that. I'm before, before this whole generation. I realized, for us looking at people on the phone was like something we only did on TV, like the Jetsons or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There was one. Yes. Nice to meet you, Paul Perez, Benedict College. Uh, if you went back to when you were playing in your twenties, what is the advice you would give yourself when it comes to playing the trumpet? <coughs> Be more serious. This is gonna be a long-term battle. Be more serious. When you serious, be serious. But I was serious, but I could have been more serious. Um, I, I don't I was very fortunate to come out and play, play for people, play gigs. When I was in my 20s, I played gigs, I went to jam sessions, I hung out with people, I, I went to I didn't sleep that much. I, I was so I felt so blessed to have the chance to actually play on a gig. I was afraid I was gonna spend my whole life playing horn parts. Now you know you play Irwin if I had horn parts for four or five years in high school, you don't never wanna play another horn part like that again, ever. <laughs> so for me to have the blessing to not have to do that, or to not play a job where you know I could play, but it's not something I wanted to do, which I thought I was gonna do. It was a blessing. So I, I was uh, very serious and always hooked up with musicians and hung with people and went to jam sessions all over the world and, and played with but if I could go back, I would, I would know how hard the battle is. For the culture and everything that I've seen, we've lost tremendous battles. I was hard as I could be, but I, I would understand, man, this is like a stubborn enemy. You got to be more. So that's how, what I, I think I would do. Now about my horn, I was always serious. So you got to practice your horn. You gotta, and once again, I saw my dad, you know, they practiced. Alvin Baptiste, they practiced. That parallel, there was practices. So they weren't making money, but they was practicing. You know what I mean? So I understood about practice. Thank you for your question. You got to you, you, you cool? You sure? Yeah. Yes. How you doing? Hey. Uh, first of all, I'm really scared right now. Hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you scared of me? You, 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 you have nothing to be worried about. I'm 61. You don't have to worry about nothing. Don't be scared. Of me. I can't get over towards you. I'm having trouble walking towards you. I, I've been watching you. Uh, I thank you for all you do as an ambassador for the music. Yes, sir. Um, my question is, uh, when you're approaching a passage of uh, something as simple as a, a 3625, what are you thinking about when you know what's coming with the okay. song process? So I'm going I'm to I'm tell you all about a way of thinking. Okay, there's two ways to think of things. Now there's thousands, but it's two basic modes of thought you always want to employ. The one, one form of thought is what's the macro? What's in the macro world, right? It's a thousand people running in a certain direction, okay? I better be one of them thousand. That's the macro thought. Man, there's a lot of people running, let me go that way. Then there's another thought. They might all be running to get killed. Maybe I better assess what I'm doing and right now I'm gonna hide under this car. See, you assess the big, so you play the two, three, six, two, five, one, two, three, two, first, understand the mechanics of it. It's just the same scale. Okay, on the macro level, where is it going? 
three, six, two, five, one, then it's going away. Okay? So if you understand on the macro level, if it's in one key and it's going to another key, here we go. Right? I ain't want those. <laughs> Okay. On the on the macro level, you just in the key of in, in the trumpet key of F. Right. You can just play in that key, and it's okay. On the micro level, it's each change. Trumpet section with a great trumpet player named Marcus Prim. 
one day that I remember peace. It required like a real nice solo church trumpet. But man, Marcus, you know, he could play church trumpet much better than me. But they wrote the trumpet part in my part. So when we looked at it, me and Herlin Riley was playing drums, he said, man, Marcus, you know. <laughs> so I said, yeah, Marcus, I'll play better than me. I said, yeah, Marcus, you want to play this solo? He was, he was like, yeah, man, you know, I'll play it. I gave it to Marcus. And the cast and pants don't laugh. I'm scared to play the solo. I'll give it to Marcus. And Marcus said, there's four of us back here. And if you put all of us together, you got one hell of a trumpet player. And I always kept that kind of a something of how I think it with a lot of other musicians. Like, man, if I had a hat that looked good as yours on, you know what I'm saying? What do you have to tap you on that hat? You playing around. You know, so you always look at people as attitude. Like, there's a lot of us in this room. There's a lot of band directors in this room. There's a lot of people with information. My job is to give them information or do what I can do. And, and you're going to do something. I don't know what you're going to do. You might be the one who do one part of the job. Does that make sense? So that's how I'm looking at it. I see your bed. You sure you're in college? <laughs> okay. Let's check some ID, Todd. We got <laughs> Thank you for your question. How are you doing, Mr. Marcello? How are you doing? Good. My name is Deja Wilson. I'm a professionist, and I attend Norfolk State University. It's great to see you. Good to see you, too. Yeah. The question I had for you was, what do you believe helped mold you into the musician? Seeing my father and other musicians and the struggles they had and how they believed in it. So I knew they had belief. I knew other people didn't have it. I knew they practiced. I knew they were serious. And I knew they were, uh, they were smart. They win arguments at the barbershop. People like their music. They say, you can't argue with us. And they play jazz. They don't be no argument. So it was just seeing that, that seriousness. And I can maintain it. I'm serious. So even now, I'm analyzing myself. I, I need to learn how to play without really warming up. Mm -hmm. I didn't like my progressions I was doing. I'm always thinking, you know, get better. And it never changed. The beautiful thing about music is you never stop growing if you get serious about it. And because you're serious, don't mean you don't joke around. I mean, I can clown and play around, but when I. <laughs> Does that make sense? I like your, I like your vibration too. You can do what you want to do. And when you study all the great people, like Max Roach, you know, whatever instrument you play, you're going to find people who are so great, you're not going to believe it, but believe it. And a lot of them I knew. And because I had the chance as a younger person to know really, truly great people, it didn't seem that remote. Like, you have any idea how much music Sarah Vaughn knew? <laughs> it's like, I just laugh. I remember I met Sarah Vaughn. And she, I was, I was playing some obscure Duke Ellington tune I learned. I was like 21. I said, man, oh, nobody knows this tune. Sarah Vaughn said, yeah, baby, that's the, she playing the wrong changes. She sat down with a piano. Now, let me play like a pianist. I, 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 I didn't remember she played in her own hands, baby. She's a piano player. I told her to hear her play on that piano. Damn, you play that much piano, you sing it? She played all the changes to the tune. And she told me, when you learn the song, learn it off the records. Don't look at any written music to work on your ears. So you know, you keep the keep the feeling of the people you knew and how serious they were. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. That's it. I'm with you. Yes. Uh, I my name is uh, Kevin Benaire from Los Angeles State University. Yes. I'm a flute player. Yes. My well, question for you, sir, is uh, what's the strangest instrument that you see on the jazz band? Because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the way people playing on it sounds strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it could be a trumpet, but I hate what they play. Man, what There's a lot of people who can play flute. We got Ted Nash is playing with us. He's one of the greatest flute players in the world, ever. So when you get a chance, <clears throat> look up with Ted on the flute. And, and matter of fact, we were talking last night about Kid Jordan, the saxophone player in, in New Orleans, put on the first concert of the world saxophone course. His son, Kent, is a flute player. And what made me get serious, really, about practicing was Kent. I was, I was always clowning and playing around, and I told Kent, I was I, I was, first I was teasing about playing flute. Back then, you could do that kind of stuff. And then I said, man, you're a flute player, man. I, I was always playing basketball and clowning in the school, and he was always practicing, looking at me like I was an experiment while he practiced. <laughs> so he, I started talking, man, you playing flute, blah, blah, blah. He said, man, put that ball out. I said, man, I was playing on the team then. And he, I said, man, you, you know, you're a flute player, man. 
He said, man, I'll take you outside and whip you behind with that ball. I said, ain't no way in the world no fruit plate gonna beat me. <laughs> man, I, I mean, I was like a freshman in, in, I was a freshman, I was in eighth grade, and he was a junior all the season. Well, he took me out there. Man, he could play. <laughs> so I had promised him, I said, if you beat me, I'm gonna practice like you. But man, he was practicing like three or four hours every day. But then I started to practice. And it was, a lot of it was because of that, we were just joking around. So you can play any instrument if you learn how to play it. I played once at the festival of, of Istanbul in Turkey. And a dude had said, can I, can I sit in with the band? I said, yeah, man, you know, you can sit in with us. So, I, but I was just, I didn't know he was gonna come out there. Man, he came out on the gig with an instrument. I didn't even know what it was. I was just looking at it, I said, damn, what you? And, and I, he said, I said, what you wanna play? He said, blues, man. And he started playing some blues. He could play. So you know what I mean? We have practice. Make sure you hook up with Ted Nash and get, get him. I'm going to make sure you play some flute for you tomorrow. I said, okay, we're going to turn him loose and you're going to be like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Mr. Marcellus, my name is Roger Robinson, Dirk State University, yes, trumpet player. Yes, uh, my question is, who would you consider your role model uh, growing up playing the trumpet? Freddie Hubbard. First, mm. all of us in the 70s love Freddie Hubbard. Then as I began to know more, I mean not more like against Freddie, but just more people, uh, the musicians I saw, I saw Clark Terry. So I was 12 or 13, I hung with him. So I loved him. I would listen to Miles Davis' record, so of course I loved Miles. Uh, then, then I knew Blue Mitchell, I hung out with him. So I knew Blue. Sweets Edison was from another generation, but I knew Sweets. So when I be around Sweets, he was real funny. And he talked real country like a happy boy, you know. I mean, if you flirt with everybody he saw, he was always saying something. So I love Sweets. But Sweets played a few notes, you know. He didn't play a lot. I was afraid of him. Sweets just. Doo, 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 doo. I didn't like that kind of music at that time. So then I started to more people I knew, the more I started to add to what I, I liked. And then when I came to New York, I met Woody Shaw, so I liked him. And I would listen to his records. And then, you know, like that, there's a lot of younger musicians I like too. Like, I love Roy Harper, Nicholas Payton, the people who started to come after Ryan Kaiser, people I played with. I love them. So, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, a lot of people. But Freddie was the one everybody would sell was like. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Am I supposed to be getting over there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just standing there. I'm just like, I'm sorry. All right, so I'm back again with another question. Oh, man, come on. Come on, man, come on, man. don't do this kind of stuff. You know better than this, man. All right, for sure. So when it comes to uh, the biggest moment in your life, whether it be gig or whatever it may be, and you're on the stage, what are you looking for in a drummer? Like, what are you looking for? What are you feeling for? Because I'm a percussionist, so I'm asking this for all the drummers out there. What I want from a drummer is not to ask two questions in a row. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's like, it's like they always say, a big people got to be kind. If you live in the, on the street in a, in a neighborhood with a bully that's big and they, they're not nice, you have a hard time. Mm -hmm. The bigger a person is, the quieter they got to be. Mm -hmm. Everybody have a good time. That's real. So the drummer, the drummer has the loudest, that was a Freudian snippet, the drummer has the loudest instrument. And when they sit down and play all loud and ignorant, mm -hmm and don't listen, and don't share space, and don't know how to play, it's not. It. You know what I'm saying? The drum is a king. Yeah. The woman is a queen. The drums is the central location of everything. One of my great mentors was a drummer from, from Africa. A guy named Yakub Adi, he's passed away now. And he always talked about the sound of the drums. Let me see you busy with your phone, man. Nah, man, I'm No, 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 that's all right. <laughs> I ain't mad at you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> respect. respect, I respect you. <coughs> but you, that's what I'm saying. Um, I'm here, Scott from Grand State University, I play bass. That's right. And uh, my question for you is, um, in, in today's music industry, what is the most important thing uh, for, for us as musicians in order for us to strive? And, and not just because, you know, I love music, but I, I want to do it as my job and actually be able to sustain it. So, so what's the most important thing to, to give and do that? Let me make something, something that I want to tell you just very basically. I hate the music industry. It's trash. They sell trash. 
it's garbage. You get your story so out. If you ask me what I think about it, I don't think nothing about it. What do I think about the executive decision? I don't respect it. So what you gotta do is what they do. And it ain't hard to do, because it's not hard. Do more than what they do. You don't want to be associated with trash. And by trash, I don't mean actual trash. There's much, it's, that's an honorable job. What they doing. Trash. For itself. You listen to it. Why you want to do that? Don't do that. That's like somebody proud of being a pimp. Don't nope. do it. <laughs> pimp name slip it. I'm too being honest with you. I'm about music. The music is not about music. You want to learn about music? Go talk about music. Man, I'm about music. Selling stuff to people who don't know better. I'm not about that. Using people's sexuality to exploit 11 and 10 year olds, 12 year olds. No. I've been against it 40 years. It's a losing battle, but it's worth fighting. I don't care what nobody think about it. I don't care what they like. I don't care. I'm a real nigga. If it ain't about music, it's some social commentary you got. You grew up a certain way, man. I'm sorry. You know what happened to you? Everybody's a victim now. We all victims of something. But learn how to play music is a different proposition. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Xavier Edwards, yes, sir. junior music head major from Jackson State. My question is, how do you make the learning process equitable for young students and those who aren't privy to jazz beforehand? If you want to know something, go after it to get it. This country, man, it's, it's easy to get information. I'm still learning. I get a, even get on YouTube, and I just, I, I look at stuff. I, I want to get my orchestration better. I start looking at different people. I'm going to study this. I'm going to look at this. You can learn. My, my, my brother, said he was talking about how Morgan State has a thing where people from the community can come to classes if they want. A, a person, citizen in the, in the community can just come and all the classes and we start laughing so you don't have to worry about people abusing that. If you want to learn something, go be around it. I tell you, when we come places and we play, whoever we've seen down through the years, it didn't matter what they had. When I was growing up, man, nobody had nothing. People didn't have nothing. But if my daddy then was playing, or if any of the great teachers we had, Elvin Baptiste, Kid Jordan, if you came around them, they was teachers. And it's still, that's the vibe. You gotta be hungry. And if you're hungry, you're gonna get fed. And if you're hungry enough, you're gonna hunt. Be that way about some knowledge. You gonna, you know what I mean? You with me? That's what it's about. It's not about a lack of equity, it's about this. My daddy's story said, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make him thirsty. I'm Darian Bivens. I'm a trombonist at Granville State University. Well, my mama went to Granville, so I would like to like you. Wow. Come on, man. What you laughing about? What you laughing at, Grandma? <laughs> 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 well, my question is, is were there times where you lost motivation musically and what are some things that helped you persevere through that to become the musician you are today? That's a good question. Yeah, there were times, the shirt not, that I, that I, uh, not that I lost, I, w I wouldn't say motivation, but it's so discouraging. But in my time, what I saw happen, just the decline of everything in the dream. My father and the man, it was, it's been trampled on, basically. Yeah, I, I was, and then I went through a period where every review or interview of me was always negative because you're trying to break my spirit and make me give up and co-sign trash. So it became a thing, yeah, it, it, it warmed me, but I put on a record, listen to Duke Ellington, listen to Miles, listen to Disney. <laughs> I put on sweets, I, you know, I, plus I was always around older people and younger people. I look at my younger students, so sometimes I'll be in a... <laughs> I was telling Jonathan, <laughs> he would send me tape, he would send me stuff with him playing. Okay, and there's no way for him to know this. This years, this go back years. And sometimes I wouldn't respond to him. But he'd be saying, man, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm playing. This is what I'm doing. I put on this thing. And I look at him, he had this big look from me. <laughs> Working on the other side, it made me feel like, okay, we need to be out there. There's no way for him to even know to this moment he had that type of impact on me because I know when he's writing to me. 
But I'm getting it and I'm looking at it and I see what he's doing and I see what his struggles is and I see how serious he is. So even though he's much younger than me, and even though I get the publicity or whatever, still I'm looking at him thinking. And it reminded me how I was when I was when I was hungry like that and I was serious about it. He put on a concert for me, like, man, check this out. You know, I'm playing this. What you think about this? So you gotta always, you know, above you, the people who are older, yeah, you're always getting inspiration. Sometimes they, they hard on you. When you look at the younger people, they always give you some inspiration, the ones that are serious. So that's what I think, you know? Teach some people and you'll be taught. Always be in that cycle. Yeah, I think for all of y'all, always teach somebody. When you're teaching younger people than you, you're gonna, they're gonna teach you a lot. Does that make sense? Thank you. Y'all that trombone. We got a lot of good trombone players here. We got the great Elliot Mason. We got we got Vincent Gardner. And we got Chris Crenshaw. That's three of three. That's a murderer's row right there. You can go, go to him and say, hey, we cannot. Don't be a stranger. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Marcellus. Um Lance Marquis Anderson, uh Junior Music Education student, North Carolina AT. Um as musicians or as people, when people go into the workforce and their jobs, they have to take their necessities that they need to work with. Like if you work in a business, you're gonna need your folders. Like if you need a laptop, you're gonna need that. As musicians, our tools are our instruments, you know? And every instrument has a story. So I was wondering if you could tell us some stories about your instrument, or like, you know, how you came to get your horn, you know, stuff like that. Okay. My horn is made by a guy named Dave Moyer. I met him when I was, I don't know, 20, 20, 21. And he's maybe 26. He'd be making, he's been making troubles for me all, all those years. He just make one whenever he sends it to me. Now, he lives in Portland. My horn was broke, this horn. It, it wasn't working. He got on a plane. And we've known each other 40 years, so. He got on a plane this last Saturday. Flew to New York. I saw, he, he said, I saw a picture of your horn that's been fixed it. He got back on the plane and went home. Now, we both, it, 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 you know, he got challenges with his, with, his, with, with his health, and he's in a certain stage of his life. But the kind of bond and love we have, it's in his heart, for me. Everybody have a different. So, you know what I'm saying? It's a, just that gesture alone. If you think about that, that's a long way from Portland to New York. And he got a lot of stuff that he had to deal with. He did that. And that means so much to me. Most of the stuff that's gonna mean stuff to you is about human beings and what they do, much more than the thing. So when I play that horn, that's his horn. All through the years he would come to gigs, like you remember, we're talking about 1981, and now it's 2020, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, think of how long that is. He would show up at certain gigs and say, man, I just came to hear you. When I was playing my horn for him, just this time, I just played, just me and him sitting in my house, and I played, Always I play like a brace for you or a ballad. I play something. And he said, damn, that was worth the trip. Man, that made me feel so good. That made me feel like the tapes John's gonna be sending me. You, you wanna always, you know, with your people, have that human connection and never forget it. You know what I'm saying? Yes, and it's important. Like even you can tell, me standing here with you talking to you, you feel something. But you, what you can't understand is that thousands and thousands and thousands of kids, younger people I taught and talked to, but also how people talk to me. Is my dad, Sweets, John Fernandez, John Longo, people that Jerry Mulligan, it don't matter. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a race. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't about that. It's about a humanity. You know, you feel it. I don't have to tell you advertise it. And I felt that when Jonathan said that. We, and this is it's a thing we all live in. And what I hate about the music industry is it crushes that and destroys it. And it turns a person into a commodity. You ain't a commodity, you're a person. I don't care where you come from. So it's important, you know, for us to. And so that's what my horn means. To. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, or good afternoon, sir. Yes, yes, sir. My name is Timothy Lemon. I'm a player at Norfolk State University. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, sir. I wanted to ask you what kind of drew you to jazz and also. A lot of people should know you actually are one of the master in classical as well. So what also drew you to the classical genre? It's just my father. They were playing jazz. And my daddy was not prejudiced against music. So he would say, man, check this out. So one night, my mama, 
decided that she was going to take all of us. To, it was like five of us. It was four of us at that time. She was going to take us to see the symphony. Have you want to see that? <laughs> Y'all don't understand. You'll be back in those times, man. We were segregated. My mama grew up in all segregation. So she put us all in our best suits, and we got our suits from like, you know, CS Catalog, because we had ugly little checkered suits. Some of the ugliest stuff we ever saw. <laughs> but we stayed in our environment. I mean, we never, and my mama put all of us, my daddy wasn't there, he probably playing the gigs. I think she put all of us in this, in this Volkswagen van to hear a classical concert she definitely did not want to hear. Man, we walked in there, we were like the only black people. We felt so, so, so Subconscious man, you know, we're like, damn, man, we, mama dragging us to this. Man, we sit down and we start playing. Damn, there's a brother in the orchestra, but he playing flute. Damn, man. Uh, <laughs> me and my brother look at each other like, man, we got a brother in the orchestra playing flute. So now we gotta listen to the music. Then the music started with us like, man, this ain't that bad. But damn, the music just kept going and going and going. Man, this music takes forever. Then when it got to be the half, we was like, we ready to go. My mom said, we ain't going. Nah, -uh. sit your ass down. <laughs> you, go you ain't this? going nowhere. And look, she wanted to go. See, I understand now. She wanted to go more than any of us, but we did not go. We sat to the end of the concert, okay. I had that experience. The guy who was playing flute was named Richard Harris. I ended up going to a camp where he was a counselor. I told him the story he was laughing about. Him. But later, uh, 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 the, the New Orleans Civic Orchestra was rehearsing. And I remember because this is when Monday Night Football first started. And a partner of mine called me and said, man, I'm the only brother down here. Come play with this orchestra. I said, man, Monday Night Football. <laughs> 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 you know, I ain't missing Monday Night Football. You know, month for, that was when it was new. It was something like it was a big deal. Todd, do you remember that Monday Night Football when it started? Man, you can't believe how it was. He said, man, come on, the other man is playing timpani. Well, so we like our weatherman in New Orleans. I said, man, I gotta go just to see the weatherman. I went down to the first one, it was in the Jewish Community Center, where we would play ball. And I looked, damn, the weatherman was playing Tiffany. We were playing Beethoven's fifth, seven. I was like 13, 12, 13. And this, for some reason, the first time I realized this guy wrote this. Okay, I had records of it through my dad, but we didn't listen to him. Man, the music was so great. And I mean, we were playing like we were playing with Shrug in the city box. But I looked around, I said, man, I like this. I started to read about Beethoven. I got a book called Fans Life of Beethoven. And I started, man, Beethoven went deaf. Like his story was interesting. Beethoven went through this, Beethoven went through that. I started listening to the music. Then I got into classical music. So I always think your interest, you gotta always make you listening. And, and because my daddy was how he was, he was always encouraging me, man. You can read what you want. Know, you know. I remember once I told people studying that they never saw him. I was, I was a man by that time, 20 something. I said, man, you think I like a jazz song? He said, well, man, what is that? You got your song. If you want to sound better, sound better. Practice. And my daddy never played with me. He told me I was maybe 50. So he called me once. He said, man, I just heard you on the record. You ain't heard nothing about changes yet? <laughs> <laughs> so does that make sense what I'm Yes, sir. I do have one more question. Yes. Also, how would you, how do you handle adversity? So with me, um, I'm actually a double major in physics and chemistry pre med with a minor in music. So, like, uh, doing that, uh, and also man as well. It's kind of a lot, but I also know that you're going to a lot of this stuff. So, how exactly do you handle that adversity to um, kind of sort past and just be basically be good? Okay, all those things are, are related physics, chemistry, music, it's all related. So, you can, you have, you're going to have the advantage because now all of a sudden you got eyes that you can see over here while you're looking over here. Now you can see over here too, man, you got this kind of, you, you, you know already they're all related. You study it so you can see it. You know, I'm gonna tell you a story I would always tell my, my older kids when they were growing up, but I'm gonna make it short. During the nights of the round table, the green knight stole the queen. He said, I'm gonna kill the queen in the year. Somebody has to come get the queen. So three knights said they would come, Galahad, Gawain, and Lancelot. Well, they had tests they had to go to. The greatest of the nights was Sir Lancelot. So whenever the three knights had a test, the first one was you had to get in a cart. In the Middle Ages, man, you didn't want to get in a cart. They're going to throw rotten eggs on you, call your names, treat you like you had done something disreputable. 
Uh, Gawain and Galahad said, we're not getting in the car. We'll ride behind it. We ain't getting in it. Lancelot said, I'll get in it. There you go. That's the first thing. I'll do it. He got in there. was an old woman in the car. And she said, if you want to go find the queen, you got to cross the bridge. It's the blade of the sword. <laughs> and I got to cross a bridge? It's the blade of the sword? Are you crazy? So she tells him how to get there. He has a sharp cut to it because of her, because he got in the car. He gets to the blade of the sword. And he, he just stands there and says, man, nobody's going to make it across this. It's over a boat that has rushing water with all kind of stuff you don't want to encounter. So he stands there for a day. He can't figure it out. Two days. Then he asked the people, I mean, how did the people, did anybody ever cross this bridge? Did nobody ever crossed this bridge. Everyone dies. So how do they die? Well, they lose their balance and they fall in. Then there's two lions that you have to fight if you get across that blade of the soul. <laughs> Damn. So he looks at it, now the third day comes and he says, okay, well, I'm crossing this bridge. He take off all his armor. No sword, nothing. He started to go across on his hands and knees. Man, of course, he gets all cut up. But when he gets close to the edge, it's not lions, it's dogs. And because they never saw a person, they get scared and run. Now I'll tell you who the Green Knight is. The Green Knight cuts his own head off before he fights you, and then he puts his head back on. So you look at him like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to win this. <laughs> when he finally got there, the Green Knight said, okay, you made it. How did you figure out the rhythm of the bridge? He said, I didn't have to worry about getting cut. This is about being cut. It's like a fight. Everybody thinks they're throwing punches. <laughs> you're going to take punches. If, if, you, if you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run around my, my block, you're going to be tired after one block. Man, if you say, I'm running to California, you ain't gonna be tired of the block. You're gonna at least get to St. Louis when you say, I might not make it to California. <laughs> you know, does that make sense? Thank you, sir. Yes. Hey, my name is Carson Matthews, too, but from uh, North Carolina a and I love that, too. Yes, sir. My question for you is if your dad didn't play an important factor in your influences, you know, what you decided to play, what, what do you think you would be? What do you think you would be? Probably. I, you know, probably something, something, uh, something academic. I mean, I, I like to, to do stuff. I, was, I, I understood the kind of value of intelligence because people in my neighborhood would always say, man, ask this dude. And I was one of the smallest ones. Ask this dude, man, this dude kind of level-headed. What you think, bro? I mean, I'm, if you're nine or 10 and people 13 or 14 ask you questions, you think there's a value to intelligence. Or we'd be playing ball, I could always kind of figure out stuff. So maybe that, that kind of stuff. You know, so it's important always for y'all to understand, even though it's undermined, there's a value to intelligence. And that's what I, what I would, would have done. I mean, it wouldn't have been jazz, man. I, mean, I wouldn't have encountered it. Like, more, none of my friends ever said the name of a single jazz musician the whole time I grew up. Never the single name of anybody. I'd be saying, man, y'all know about so and so. They'd be like, yeah, bro. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Marcellus. My name is Stefan Hoffman Jr. I'm a senior music education major at Lee Grammar State University. Oh, say it again. Lee Grammar State University, a place where everybody is somebody. Oh, okay, I'm not rooting for nobody. Come in here with all of that. I'm a trombonist. Um, my question, I have two questions, actually. In a few words, how would you describe the vision and legacy you will leave behind for future musicians to have a greater love and passion for music? I don't, I don't, I don't really think about that, you know? I don't, I don't, you don't know what you're gonna leave behind. You don't, and you can't control that. You just gotta, you might be the legacy I leave behind. I don't know. You know, I have no way of, way of knowing. So my second question would be, well, what are some words of encouragement you would give an aspiring professional musician while continuing their course to success? This is a struggle. I met Ella Fitzgerald one time on the stage of Carnegie Hall, 1987. Because she sounds so much like, so girlish, you think she's like a girl. <laughs> she's not. <laughs> so I go over to her and hug her and say, of course, I'm Miss Fitzgerald. I'm with myself before I get my name off. She goes, I know who you are. I know what you're trying to do. This is going to be very difficult for you, baby. So I'm waiting for the smiles. So I'm, mm -mm. 
I looked at her, yes ma'am. She said, good luck. And I hugged her, kissed her on her cheek. She patted me on my back. When I walked away, she looked at me and <laughs> So I think, you know, do this. This is a great profession. Music is great. To touch the music, to play with people. Marcus Prentevin and I had breakfast this morning because Ryan Kaiser, our trumpet player, is, is not, is, is, is ill and can't make this concert. Marcus and I at 7.30, we, we, we talk, and we both, I mean, we see each other every night. We've been 25 years, 27 years in the same conversation. And he, we were saying at this stage how great it was to play together, how much of a blessing and an honor it was to play the music, how much love we had for each other, and how the band, the feeling in the band is like that, even through COVID and all this. When we sit on that band stand, man, let's survive. Like, hey, let's, even tomorrow when we sit up there, we, we got two members that we didn't know will come in at the last minute. I saw the great Mike Rodriguez. Mikey came in. I remember Mikey in the class when he was a kid. I said, Mikey, can you play for All Heart from the Portrait of Brother Fitzgerald? He said, I'm here for you, baby. It don't matter. I'm gonna play whatever we play. So you know what I'm saying? It's like when you get with this, this is a blessing to play this. So what I tell people is this, this is a struggle. And it's a blessing. So you can't get one without the other. You know what I mean? Okay. Yes. How are you doing, Mr. Marsalis? Um, my name is Joseph Biacom. I'm on piano. I play piano at Norfolk State University. All right. Um, we share the same birthday, by the way. Boy, you lined up. <laughs> you did a good job on your line. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Get it, Jojo. You see that line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a good line. <laughs> I let him know you said that. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't playing. <laughs> um, we share the same birthday, by the way. See that? Yeah. See, I hope it don't break your bad luck. <laughs> you never know. Um, recently, I uh, heard a quote that said, the more you learn about your instrument, the less you understand it. And with all of the chords, scales, inversions, feels, genres, with, with so much there is to learn and to practice, how do you maintain all of these things without losing another aspect when you add more layers of music? That makes sense. Oh, you know, the elephant got a trumpet. <laughs> That's how you don't lose it. What's the purpose of our instrument? We're a herald instrument. I always mess with saxophones and say, trumpet in the Bible. <laughs> There's a saxophone in there? <laughs> but I'm just joking and messing with them. You just, you just once again go back to what I was saying about macro and micro thoughts. Think about it in this way. We're just other people out there. Man, it's, I don't know, I'm at 7.8 billion people. We just two people. We make a statement as trumpet players of all the people who play trumpet. People who can't play, people who are great, younger people, people who are, it doesn't matter, we trumpet players. So all of us together represent one trumpet. That's a macro thought. Therefore, it's not up to you to be the only trumpet. You're a trumpet player. You work on your stuff and you keep getting better. You don't have to get play everything, you're gonna play what you play. Clark Terry could play. I once asked the great Sweet Edison, how did he feel about being in the trumpet section with uh, Buck Clayton? Because all the, all, the, all the ladies liked Buck Clayton in the 1930s. Okay, because Buck had green eyes and he was good looking and handsome. And, Ooh, Buck. Sweets, they did. Oh, Sweets, okay. Yeah, you know. He said, uh, every night I had the greatest concert in the world. Thanks to that man right there, Buck Clayton. He was a gentleman, and he played some of the most beautiful trumpet. And when those times were over, I missed the sound of Buck Clayton. See what he was telling me? He was teaching me? Buck Clayton. I saw, I met Buck Clayton one time. I was playing a, a, a gig, and I had on a lime green suit and white shoes. Man, but it was clean, though. Okay. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it was, it, come on, you look, it sound crazy, but it was lime. It was soft green. It wasn't all loud. It was a lime green. And Buck came to me, and he looked at me, and I played a gig. And trumpet player from his generation, I, I couldn't really play, and he knew it. So he looked at me like, and he said, you know, what can I tell this dude? He didn't sound good. So he said, man, I really like that suit. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, my favorite football team. I'm from New Orleans, man. I've been mean, from the Saints, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm from New Orleans, I can't. Oh no! Oh, oh. Don't, don't go 
we get talking at, man. We still got time to go. I don't want to even hear none of that stuff. Stop this, no longer than boys. Stop all that. <laughs> you know better than that, man. That's all I'm doing. I can't believe it. How long did that just happen? Security. Security! He bumped it again. Too many. Yeah. Just the other day, I was looking at a, at a, a tape about, about how to orchestra it. And they, they, and they were talking about space, like in, a, in an orchestra, like how, how you use the string section as a rhythm section. You know, for us, we have a rhythm section all the time. So I was thinking, man, I said, okay, how can I break up the, the, the function of the rhythm section? So, because once a rhythm section starts to play in jazz, they don't stop. So how can I break up the function of a rhythm section and have strings play like a roll of a piano? So a bass function kind of is the same, but to give the strings part of a percussion function and use a percussion less like a drum set and more like accents, like I can use a brass in an orchestra. So I started to think about it. Just you know, I started looking at scores and trying to figure it out. I was doing that yesterday, you know. So today I started to also just try to think about it. But I'm always thinking about something. You know, and another thing is that it's important for you, for you to understand everybody's day. You don't figure things out every day. It's like a math problem. Like the most difficult problems, you may work on that. Like Albert Einstein said, he could never figure out the grand unification theory. The Nobel Prize was awarded to three scientists, uh, three physicists, just this last year for them figuring out what quantum entanglement was and that they figured the universe is situational. They, they just figured that out. So we think about problems individually, and sometimes we solve them, and sometimes we don't. And we as human beings think about problems collectively, and sometimes we solve them. So, uh, you know, in, in music, there are many problems to, to solve. So I'm always thinking about it. It's kind of fundamental problems of how to bring cultures together. And I understand that we played with a great oud player from Iraq named Nasir Shama. And we were talking about what do skills mean to people who don't know that the melodies you play have a meaning. Like if I listen to some music from another culture and I don't know what the melodies mean. So to me, it sounds like scales they play. But to them, <laughs> it's their culture, so they know what the music is. I don't know if that makes sense to me. I listen to flamenco music, it sounds like just running up and down scales. They're not, those are melodies they play. But they're not melodies in the sense of our culture. Another thing I learned from our bassist, Carlos Enriquez, when he was a kid, I was telling him, Man, the problem with Latin music is they, they, don't, they only have one chord. He said, do you know what any drum is playing, man? You have three, three drums playing through a whole track, then you're going to put a bunch of chord changes in there? That's stupid. <laughs> right? Now, he was just 15. So, of course, I had to play it off like I had thought of it. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there are always problems that you, that you start to think about and you solve as you go along. But you work on stuff every day. Maybe it take you 10 years to figure out one thing. Man, it took me like... 12 or 13 years just to get my sound where I was just kind of comfortable with. Because Sweets and all of them was always saying, man, you got to do something about your sound, baby boy. Sound like you're going into a toy. <laughs> Sweets actually brought me back a trumpet from, from, from Paris, a Selma K modified old school trumpet. He said, I was thinking about that little puny sound you had when I brought you this trumpet. And he, he gave me the trumpet and he said, play something on it. And I played a few notes, he said, that's not the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> he, took, he took his arm back too. He didn't let me hit it. The guy took it off my head. It's not the trumpet. <laughs> so you know what I'm saying? You keep working on stuff, and everybody is working on stuff. So it ain't just up to you to figure it out. Yes. Good morning, the music. How are you doing? Today? Okay, so I like your little moniker. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, good music. I'm with you. My name is Dave uh, D.W. I'm from the illustrious Elizabeth City State University. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got to do it. No, I mess with you. But as a composer, arranger, what do you have any tips or concepts that you think would help launch that as a career? Yes, as a career, I don't know. 
Most people compose a range of films. Yeah, that's nowadays. I can only talk to you about being a composer and arranger. If you want to know as a career, you got to talk to people who are already doing it. Like if you see Terrence or you see Terrence Bradshaw would be great. What's my what's my young young guy that's doing a lot of playing piano? I'll think of it. But when you run into people who are doing the thing you want to do, get advice from them. Don't accept the advice from somebody who don't know about it. And uh, thank you. As a side question, for you composing an arrangement for your band, what tips or concepts work for you uh, that helps convey your ideas and their point? My, my music is always conversation with person. Like if I tell you to play something, play it like you this, play it like you this. Another thing is work on melodies. Where, what is the source of your melodies? That's the question you want to ask yourself. Sing your parts, even internal parts. Sometimes if I'm working with something, I'm even in the piano, if I can't figure out a harmony, I start singing it. If I sing an internal voice, man, I'll find it. Sing parts and make your parts melodic. And the most important thing for you to do in this time is figure out what do melodies mean to, to me? A melody is the mythological and soul imprint of your sound. When you write cliche melodies that everybody's writing is not rooted to something in the soil, I've asked kids all over the United States, regardless of where they're from, tell me, name 10, well, I narrowed it down to three over the years, name three American folk songs before 1960. <laughs> it's a waste of time. You don't come from your folk base, it's like, you don't know what your melodies mean. So if you wanna write, what are my melodies? In terms of other technical things, like what rhythm am I writing? Learn how to write in a rhythm. The strongest rhythm in American music is a swing rhythm or any rhythm that has a three and a four put together because that's what the African rhythm is. Now, I'm telling you that because that means you're in a female and a male polarity. You put the two of them together. It means you're hot and cold. It means you don't have a polarized three or four. It means you're always trying to find a balance between two things that are not that are equally powerful and not the same. In our country, we have trouble with that. We want to write in our own. Shakespeare said to be or not to be. And the man said, yeah. Yes. Or oh, learn the blues too. In American music, you have, the blues is the most profound thing we ever came up with. Good afternoon, somebody. Chris Dan before I graduate North Carolina AT. I go to North State now for my master's in music. My question to you is, my question to you is, what, what do you consider your first big performance if you felt like you started to make it as a musician and what was your most recent performance now? My first, my first big performance, I think, was just, uh, I, I think I remember I played a gig like with my, with, with my daddy and them, they were like, okay, man, you might could be able to do it. Before that, they was always like, you said. <laughs> so I, when I was in high school, I used to be certain to read it, right? Man, I play a solo, I certainly breathe on every solo. Everybody just start howling and screaming and clapping. Ah! So I thought, hey, I'm playing better than them with people clapping for me. So one day I was playing a gig, I was like 15 or something. Man, I was like, yeah, my little crouch, I get into my brother, said, man, get into your thing. I get into my thing. <laughs> I start circling the beat. People just say, ah! I start screaming at my dad. He's calling me, he said, come here, son. I walk over to him and say, hey, man, the circus is down the street. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I said, okay. But I think maybe when I when I got to where I played, he was like, okay, man, you gonna try to be serious. That for me was the first. And then for me, the last gig we played with the band, and it was like, you know, in the area, it was like one of those kind of gigs where our accommodations have been, you know, we're a certain age, man. You get a certain age, you don't want to be in, in a non dressing room with everybody, dressing, <laughs> sometimes the conditions, it's like a high school band. But you're a professional man, you get to something that's almost 60. And it was like perfect for everybody to be like, we had two gigs like in a week after working a whole week with no hotel. So we just driving from one day, playing a gig in the school in the daytime, driving eight hours to the next place. And it's like, man, everybody in the band is like, Fernando, though, he's standing back there with me, this is my man, Fernando. He's been with me driving and organizing travel for many, many years. Okay, from, from, he's from, originally from Venezuela. This, this is my absolute man. We talk about everything. So before the gig, he's looking at me saying, man, you know, if 
a lot of things as soon as he dropped as a watchery of the lake. Right? When we got out there, they stopped playing. So for me, I can't say nothing else. When it comes to actually playing, we've been so serious about what we do and we're gonna play. And I'm confident in it. So that's my latest. So do you know? That's it. And notice, when I, when I give y'all answers to these kind of things, it's always something internal. It's not no outside recognition. Stuff in your life is internal. Hello, uh, my name is Trey Maj, I'm Mike Petrie. Um, I'm from Grambling State University. I'm a trumpet player. Um, what advice or tips do you have for a musician that is new to the jazz culture and want to improvise? Like what goes through your mind while you play and how do you play what you hear or see? Okay, first, don't read your question like that. Okay, that's the first advice. Just tell me, you can't say, hey man, what is this? That's jazz. You know what jazz is? It's like you tell me something, okay? I understand it. If you gotta go on, um, uh, wait a second, do that. That's jazz. All that, all that things. Now you said about hearing, right? Yeah. You gotta listen to be able to hear. It's like learn a language. Am I gonna learn Italian if I don't listen to it? And the, and the higher quality you listen to, the higher quality you're playing. It's just like talking. If you listen to a lot of ignorant talking, when you talk, you're gonna be ignorant. <laughs> it's just what it is. It don't mean you are ignorant, it means you are listening to a lot of ignorant talking, therefore you are ignorant. That's why you gotta watch hanging with people. So playing is the same way. Always make the quality of music you listen to higher. Now there's a school of thought that ain't no such thing as a difference in quality. Man, there's a difference in quality in everything. If I make you some grits, you're gonna say, damn, it's just nasty. <laughs> you ain't gonna say, man, it's just grits, it's all the same. <laughs> I'm gonna say that because I'm making sad grits. <laughs> you are gonna say, these grits don't taste good. Now, if I can get you to eat nasty grits and think it's good, man, I'm doing all right. <laughs> They've been doing that in the food industry for years. How can we take meat out of these hamburgers and still sell it to these people? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Now y'all have to understand that this is what goes on. How can I take education out of educating you but still get my system going? How can I take government out of government and still hey, get hey, you hey, 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 hey. There's a reality to it. There's a reality to it. And listen, when you get in a type of system, and the world is in this type of system. America ain't, don't think that you go other places and everybody all oh, People are struggling all over the world. What is the reality of something? How can I live in an actuality and spend your life figuring out what that actuality is? Does that make sense? You could hear, man. You have no problem here, but you gotta try to hear. If you spend all your time looking at chord changes like you was looking at them notes, ED, you're never gonna play. I'll guarantee you that. If you go get a bunch of scales and cards, you will never be able to play. You're gonna be sad your whole life. If you just put all that aside and listen to it and imitate it, like how you learn how to speak, you're gonna be able to play. That might take you two years, three. I told you it took me 10 years, 12 years just to get my sound. It was like, it takes time. These things are difficult, some of them. And when you're in a, in a generation and time when nobody is doing it, it's even harder. And like how some people tell you, in my day, I ain't never saying that because my day was sad. It's been a struggle. So you know what I mean? You, that makes sense? I don't want you reading your stuff like that. You go to Grandma, man, come on. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, how are you doing? My name is Mr. Oliski. I'm from Montgomery, New York. I said, oh, you know, for Steve Marvarsky. Behold. Behold. Mount Vernon, y'all got good basketball teams in Mount Vernon. I see y'all. Um, but my, my real question is, it's, it's kind of like an opinion-based question. Um, as, we, as we are musicians, we know that music is something spiritual, it can evoke emotion and such souls. And I was, um, my first half of my question, I wanted to ask, in your opinion, what do you think is like the spiritual significance of music um, by the people in TOT and how it's given your life? I mean, you learn how to speak your language through music. How you know the difference between Martin Luther King can speak and how to read it? Anybody can read it. They ain't gonna sound like it. There's a reason for that. John Coltrane played the saxophone. He don't sound like that. He's telling you something. Most of what you have to communicate to people is not words. 
I'm telling you words, but you're getting another communication. And I can't say that importance to me. Man, I, I put, I was telling my daughter this morning, I said, let's listen, let's listen to Elvin Jones, the great Elvin Jones played with John Coltrane. Man, I go to Elvin's house all the time, early in the morning, sit over Elvin and stuff. I ain't gonna tell you what, what he told me, but <laughs> his plan says it, right? The spirituality. If you, if you strive for that, it's like you strive for as a human being. So now let's say, for example, I told some younger, younger guys the other night, they was talking about how hard they were. And I said, man, what about not that? No, don't dress this man like that. And what about addressing people with some respect and some love? Oh, man. No, what about it? Man, what about it? We're so far away now. God is killing everybody, saying people ain't nothing, calling ourselves names. We're so far away from reality. We're living in a, a psychotic bubble of a dream world. It's like a nightmare. And it's real because y'all live in it. But you know, it's, you know how you, you gain weight a certain way? You don't know you're getting fatter. Sometimes the mirror hits you a certain way and you. You turn up. You, 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 you got to get in the way you want to be to see yourself. But you, you, then you say, man, I'm greasy. <laughs> Mm. Then you start forgetting about it. Yeah. Okay. Spirituality is the key to everything in life. The all is all. The spirit is all. There's nothing outside of the spirit. That's not a religion. That's what it is. There is only spirit. Now think about it. And I'm, the last thing I'm going to say about it. If I look at you and I can see, you know, your features, it tells me it's you. But if I look at your skeleton, Man, you know, maybe I know it's you if I, if I go for my size. Now, let me say I'm looking at your lungs. Do I know that's your lung? Your heart? I don't know. Now I'm looking at your blood vessels. Do I know that those blood vessels belong to you? Now I'm looking at your cells. Do I know those are your cells? Now where's spirit? Spirit is deeper inside and around than that. There's no difference between me and you. It's too existential a concept for people to understand, even though they do understand it. How you know they understand it? Let a tragedy happen. All of a sudden, people work together instantaneously. People just go right to the spirit. But when it's not a tragedy, we'll get around to the spirit another time. So music conveys spirit, and it can also convey not spirit. Try to listen to music that are not products. That's my advice for you. Thank you, sir. Whip it. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Marsalis. How are you? How you doing? Doing good. My name is Dakari Holder, I play alto sax, been at college. Right. Um, so my question is... I like alto. You look like alto, please. I like alto. <laughs> I would have guessed that. I like that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So my question is, this is for the horn players. So for those who aspire to uh, want to obtain a better sound quality, better tone quality in the industry, what's the best advice you can give them? Listen to people with good sounds and entertain them. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> you know, I had a teacher a long time ago. They didn't want, they want me to change my Amish and play down. Like, I was like, man, I don't want to play down. Huh? Everybody who can play plays like this. <laughs> so he said, no, no, you got to play down. I gave him a mouthpiece. piece. That's not, it's okay. Then I went home, I put a record of Red Clay, and I put Miles Davis kind of blue, and I looked at those two records, and I looked at Miles Amish. I looked at Fred Hubbard. I said, <laughs> and then when I saw the teacher, he said, you've been working on that, on that Amish? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Thank you. Man, I, I, I know you can play. I like your vibe. If you make sure you hook up with Sherman. Don't leave Sherman to the dash. Get with them. Get with them. While you're up there, you know what I mean? Go up to him, rap to him. Say, Sherman, you know what I'm Talk to him. Yes, How you doing? Uh, my name is Bob Stegner. Is, you know, after having so much success and winning so many awards, you know, what keeps you from like being complacent? Like, what kept on motivating you? I mean, you got the mindset of like, I want more. Or there ain't no no more. I used to always tell my daughter, I, I'd be holding her hand, I'd be joking with her. She's baby, you know, I'd be like, this the greatest in the world, right here. I can hold your hand. That's good. That's it. I want my daddy to be respectful. Clark Terry. I had a lot of experiences that I would never talk about. Tell you a story about me and Jerry Mulligan. Man, I'm playing with Jerry Mulligan. They called me to play the Newport Jazz Festival. I'm 18. Hey, you want to go up to? 
to, to play in Seattle, the, the, the Jerry Mulligan one. Yeah, yeah, man, I'll go up to Seattle. So when I see Jerry, he's tall. He said, you that boy from New Orleans? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a boy from New Orleans. He said, oh, man, we be able to play counterpoint. I didn't know how to play the counterpoint game. <laughs> I play in front, you know what I mean? I, yeah. So I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started to play. I didn't know the man's music. And he recognized immediately that I could not play. <laughs> so he was like, now we got a whole night to play, just me and him in the front. He's looking at me like, damn, you know, you sad. <laughs> but he was trying to be cool about it. He was just like, but man, after two or three tunes, he was like, ooh. And he would start wondering, does this guy think he can play? I mean, the thought was going on in his mind. Now, based on how I projected, whether I thought I could play or not, it was going to determine how he was going to deal with me. At the end of the game, I said, man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to play the counterpoint. We didn't play New Orleans music. We considered it to be an Uncle Tom music. We played like funk and pop music. You know, I don't really know your music. He said, yeah, I know. He said, man, you know, he said, you, you got a long way to go, man. He said, but you, you'll get there. But you, you gotta learn, you gotta learn the music. So I said, yes, sir. Now, I was 18. Down through those years, I saw him all the time. All the time. I was always working on stuff, talking with him, with always talking about black and white folks. <laughs> this and that. I tell him something, he said, oh, that's something. Did your sociology teach you this? Did your sociology teach you that? It was always like some fact he had about what they were actually doing and what I thought was going on. Finally, like, after all these years, man, you know, we became much closer. I mean, we played a gig in Ravinia. He was the artistic director. He would book our septet every year. So I really released. It was like, then I was maybe 29 or 30, 31, somewhere in there. That's like 11 years later. I wrote a piece that was 45 minutes long. And I played 45 minutes of that piece for my set. He stood in the, on the side and listened to the whole piece. Now, between 17 minutes and 20 minutes of that piece, I wrote something in an arrangement that's like exposed flat nines at the top of a voice. It's like a flat nine, really just but it, it, for some reason it sounded good in that past. Now, he back in his, his age, and I'm sure he was getting to be in his mid-60s, then in late, mid-60s maybe. When I walked, when I was walking off the stage, he looked at me and he said, flat nines at the top of a voice, damn, you have a lot of balls. <laughs> okay, so I thought to myself, this guy, he's booking this festival, he stood and listened to 45 minutes of us playing, and he could tell that between 17 and 20 minutes, there was a passage in that flat nice at the top of a voice. So, it's always that type of engagement with stuff, and that's how I'm thinking. That's a reward for me. You win some award that nobody even heard your record. I won a Grammy. The next year, I voted for Grammys. Man, I didn't know nobody in music. Who am I gonna vote for? You gave me a form with 250,000 records on it. I'm gonna vote for who I heard of. That don't mean that. It's fake, like the rest of me is fake. It's fraudulent. After that, I didn't think nothing about it. People can't listen to all that music. It's okay, you want something, great. When you win the respect of people, somebody like Jerry Mulligan, treat you like that kind of way, that's you want something. You see, you see, you see, that's, you see what's going on? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing, bro? I am. My name is Deshaun Freeds. I'm a saxophonist at Norman State University. I have two questions. How did you develop your sound, and how do you put yourself through the instrument? That's a good question. That's a good question, man. You know, first, it's technically your sound. I like how you organize it. Technically, your sound. It's based on you, you, what, you, you, what, what type of sex would you be? Tenor? You got the deep voice for it. <laughs> you, you on the right instrument. Yeah. yeah. I, I was saying, I hope you don't play alto. You read, you read it out here, bro. Okay. Technically, you got your sound. That's like doing long tones. What I try to do with my long tone, my practice is get the, get the biggest sound at the softest volume. I try to play soft, but big. Every day I try to, to do it like a, like a meditation. And I want to hold each note for like a minute. And I want to relax my shoulders, relax my throat, make sure I'm using the air in the right way and I want to concentrate on the air. And I want that air to just be relaxed. And I want to feel that air glow through the horn. And then I want to do a meditation on it. 
You see, now when you do the meditation on it, that's when you work on your side. And what I'm doing when I'm meditating on it is, I want to say, what do I want my sound to feel like? <clears throat> now, if you're reaching in the dark, man, for the first five or six years of doing it. But then when you get to that seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth year of it, man, all of a sudden, you start to, remember we was talking about solving math problems or solving problems. Sometimes you take 30 years to figure a problem. You have to think in longer, for your sound, think in longer spans of time. One thing I'm gonna tell you is you always have your sound. I'll guarantee you, if I hear you play right now, you got your sound. So when you do your, your, your practicing, and whenever you touch your horn, always ask yourself, how can I get closer to my own sound? And those thousands of repetitions is gonna help you. Like when I was growing up, my mama used to always tell me, boy, you better bow your head before you eat that food. Boy, you better bow your head. So I was, I was you know, I, I don't even believe in the, the God that y'all praying to. And she said, I don't care what you believe. Somebody arrogant as you, just the fact of bowing your head three times a day is gonna help you. You see? So it's the gestures, it's the everyday things you do, those habits, every day. Every time you touch your heart, my sound, my sound, my sound, my sound. Man, you, your sound will improve. That makes sense? So you got the long tone, you can sound the softest volume every day. 15, 20 minutes. A minute, open your sound up, relax. Then you got your sound. Spiritual, meditation. I don't want my, feel, my sound to feel. Then every time you touch your horn, first thing on your mind, my sound. Your sound is your card. It's my business card for you. You got a deep voice, so you're ready. You have to make your, make your tone sound like that voice. Yeah, I'll be I'm good. I'm good. I like your music. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, okay, you do. I see it. It's cultivated. <laughs> I like it. Oh, my name's Troma Down the Fourth. The Grammy State University. Logic. Uh, I'm tax bonus. <laughs> my question to you is, uh, throughout your years, uh, what are some top forms of practice or systems of practice you've used to uh, keep your musicality or grow it? The musicality is only, for me, it's only one way. Everything you play, scale, any exercise, play like your music. That's it. Play like your music, right? You singing it, you put dynamics on it, Communicating with it. That way you don't have to worry about it. That makes sense. With, with that said, uh, when it comes to music, there's theory, of course, but you were talking about spirit earlier and it resonated with me because personally, I feel music more than I can say music, you know what I mean? So, do you sing your music in a certain style before you play it? I sing it to myself, but I, you don't hear it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing about the spirit is, think about the mechanics of the spirit. I, I, I always love when people try to separate like a theoretical, not saying you're doing it, a theoretical concept or a mathematical concept from a spiritual concept. Man, the spirit is so mathematical. <laughs> we still discovered one small teeny portion of the physics, the, the greatest discovery, what they got to the Nobel Prize for, I suggest y'all all go online and just see what did the people win the Nobel Prize for. This is a profound thing that they discovered. The situ situational universe is important because what it does is it makes you understand how much your perspective affects the life you live. And that's very important. You see one person, man, what was happening? Man, they weren't playing nothing. Somebody else, man, I heard the greatest. Come on, man, I ever heard they played. It's such a thing. If, you, know, you know what I mean? So don't separate those things in your mind. If you have a feeling for something in the depth of in that type of depth, you're going to know about it. So theory is very little to know. If the feeling is great, if the feeling is small, that's like I asked you your wife's birthday and you don't know it. It's like, okay. Maybe y'all think it's not about birthday. What do you know about it? I don't know. I mean, you know, I just... Yeah, I know she, I know her. <laughs> she, she, yeah, I know she, maybe she gonna be home when I get home. So she don't need to be home if we don't know nothing about her. And that's how I look at theory. You know, you need to know about it. Yes. Hey, Mr. Marcellus. My name is Wes Palms. I'm a junior at NCA and T University. I mean, a person asked a question later, well, they asked a, someone who played jazz, they had never played it before. My question for you is, in your experience, have you ever played with somebody who never played jazz before, but they had played another genre outside of it completely? All the time. I also played with a lot of elementary school bands. 
in my experience. So they couldn't play nothing. They could play a lot of things. I would always look at them when I would be playing in their band, man, sometimes I'd get up at 5.30 to go play with them. And I would look at my little trumpet, and I'd be saying, damn, I wish I could play like them. Because they playing something, you know what I'm saying? It's like, man, they play. <laughs> I'm not trying to play like them. They'd be like, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from New Orleans. Well, how long have you been playing? Oh, 50 years? <laughs> so that, that's, that's like how I try to look at it. Well, I'll try to work this as best I can. I play rock and metal music, so. Music theory and dynamics to me are just like. My question for that was, in your years of experience, when all these genres of music were coming around from the 70s and the 80s, was there ever a point in time that you thought that I could maybe take something from those genres and put it into your music? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Okay. All those musics, in American music, all those musics come from the same music. So they actually are the same music. They're not, it's not, okay, somebody has a guitar and they're playing loud. And they're, and they're going, dum, 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 And they're jumping around. <laughs> Man, you did that as a kid. Now they get a chance to do that as adults. And that's fun. So you know, it's not like I have to take this and put this in my music. It's something that's a part of playing music. And it's not music that's foreign to me. Now, I, when I play with the African master, I had no idea what they were playing. Man, I think this is nothing like that. Can y'all play that again? So you know, our musics are all connected. They do metal, rock, whatever the names are. We, we mainly put names on them to sell them. <clears throat> and to disrespect or respect them. Or disrespect or respect people. Jazz, of course, being connected to America, the black people, the white people, it suffers the most. Because it's, the, it's a very intelligent music that comes from the, the, the historical identity of people who are slaves and disrespect them. So all you can do is disrespect them. That's what it is. Now, music that they disrespect themselves, we love that. That's not a mistake, that's, the, that's how it, it is. Okay, but for me as a musician, you know, I listen to some music, people have a good time they play. Yeah. But also, I'm a trumpet player, so I don't like electronic music, because that takes you away from a trumpet. And when you start to commit suicide on your own instrument, oh. man, you play on some loud guitars and stuff, they don't hear a trumpet. The trumpet is like a little toy in your hand. They just turn it up and it's loud. The trumpet you're blowing, the lips falling off, and they just like, don't worry about that. <laughs> so that's just me, though. I mean, you know, I, I, and I don't put my prejudices on, on other young people. I'm always telling them, hey, discover your own, do your own, have your own, I got my own, do your, do your thing. Yes. How you doing, sir? My name is Robert Williams, I'm a drummer at uh, Norfolk State University. And um, I have two questions for you. My first question, um, it's kind of like along the lines of how you were talking about, like, kind of putting the sheet to the side and like listening to the music. Um, when it when it comes to like learning jazz music and the art of jazz, like, how do you go about knowing and learning and listening to the right thing? Because there can be so many different variations. Listen to that lineage, right? You know, the drum lineage. Get online, you learn the lineage. You get so many classes of great drummers. Start with Baby Dodds, Papa Drew Jones, Max Roach, Mark Blakey, Elvin Jones. You know these people's history. They know all the drums, white, black, it doesn't matter, Buddy Rich. Man, I, last week I was just looking at Buddy Rich's interviews he did before he died when he was defending jazz. <laughs> He'd be defending the music, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he, was, he was almost alone defending the music in the, in the 1980s. He was like, no, nah, no, nah, the music is this. So you don't learn the lineage. Then when you start investigating, man, there's more information available now than ever. I wish I could have been growing up 12 or 13 in this era. Man, you know what I'm saying? And you're gonna start to figure it out. And listen to the records. Oh, they talk about so-and-so, let me listen to this record. Verify stuff for yourself. Oh, but a man told me, nah, you the man. You figure it out. Or Blakey, I'm telling you, a, a good place to start in between mine and, 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 and uh, the traditional music, a good place to start is listen to Papa Joe Jones and Philly Joe Jones. So those two people, Joe Jones, these are the real Papa Joe and Philly Joe. 
And then Max wants you to genius in there. Max, you know. That's yeah, Max was he's intense. And uh, my second question, you know, obviously like you reached a level in your career and your life, just living like you're a great, you know what I'm saying? And yeah, I love about that. Well, I'm gonna pass you away so he can't tell me. Say like you're touring around the world, doing something, you may miss something on a family level or relationship level. Obviously, you have to sacrifice something to get to the level you're at. How do you deal with balancing that? Um, I never balanced it. I, I, this what I, I was. I, this what I'm doing. Now, with my daughters here, you know, my, my kids, my sons, I'm with y'all, but I'm doing this. Come, I'm gonna go to your stuff, and I, I ain't gonna be like somebody who's there every day. And I always tell them, you know what I mean, people. Sacrifice for me in a position to represent this. Man, a lot of people sacrifice for me to represent this music and to be in the position. I'm with y'all, but y'all gotta be with me. That's the nature of this go around in life. And, and it is it is sacrifice. Yeah, I don't, you know, and I'm afraid to fly, so I drive. Me and Fernando have been, <laughs> we've been on some long tracks. <laughs> we've been out there, we know each other real well. We had some. 24, 26, 8, 18, 12, 11 hour drives to a gig. But it's a blessing. So I accept you gotta sacrifice. That's life. You know what I mean? It's the nature of stuff. Appreciate it. Yes, I'm with you. Yes, sir. Hi, how you doing? How you doing? I'm all right. Uh, my name is Will Polk. I'm from Grammar State University. I'm a sex farmist. And um, so I'm a beginner, very sex player. This is just jazz and music. So, Shreveport, Louisiana. Oh, play So, um, you know, we New Orleans in Shreveport. You know, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just making sure you know it before you ask before you ask your question. Even at this age, I still, <laughs> still, I still tribal. I still got my tribal. Um, so, being around, you know, that style, um, I'm trying to, you know, like Lamont said, the whole beginner into jazz. My director describes it as the barnyard sound. So, what's your <laughs> what's your advice for developing that style? It's like you develop anything. You just keep repeating. You know, somebody you learn a dance step. They get their mirror up and they get up in there and they just run around the corner and they work it out. And we, I mean, we'd be going to dance and people be laughing at the, the people who are on the floor. See, man, you're on the wall. I don't say nothing about nobody on the floor. Get on, get on the floor, and you're gonna develop it. Like you're gonna figure out, and I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna be better than you telling yourself. Open up your sound, listen to great baritone player, Harry Carney, Joe Temple. We got, we're gonna play a piece with the baritone tomorrow night. Paul gets other play. When you see Paul, get with him. Ask him some questions. Write the answer down. Get your five best, most important questions you want to ask him. Ask Paul, say, hey man, I'm a Barry player. Can, can you tell me this? I'm gonna tell you what I did with great musicians for centuries, man. I still call people if I'm working on something. Call call them, say, Papa, this is what I'm playing. Can you show me what I should do right here, man? Listen to this. You know? So get used to asking people. On your sound, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Chickens and all the cows and everything. <laughs> Favorite song? I think uh, for just for a song, probably for a, a song, general song for everybody. I think Amazing Grace. It's just a general song for just because of the story of the song and how it sound like everything in the early music. For a spiritual, I like uh, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. For jazz, I love Moon Indigo. And then a lot of other stuff. You know? <laughs> yes. Hey, this is Marcelo. First of all, as a player, I'm a YouTuber and person and everything. Uh, my name is Greg Cole, a uh, senior meteorologist student from A and C. Sorry. See how it is. Take the whole. Very sexy player. <laughs> that's the right instrument to be a meteorologist. That's nothing. That's nothing. 
But my question is, what was the hardest thing you think you had to learn uh, to put in your, into your skill set? Like, what was the hardest thing you had to master? Um, and kind of how long did that take in that process? You didn't listen to other people, and it didn't take long. It just took me to stop thinking I was going on plan. I remember one night at a gig, I was maybe 20, 22. I thought, man, this is kind of boring, you know? This I was playing my life playing it boring. And then I stuck to ask myself, can I remember what people play? And I couldn't. So I challenged myself then, I'm going to be where I can listen to a gig and remember what people play. And then my experience of playing was different. It's just like that situation in the universe. A lot of times it's stuck to the most profound changes. All it requires for you to look at your hands for the Yes, sir. How you doing, sir? Yes, sir. My name is Harris. I attend Little City State University in Miami Vikings. Uh, I have two questions. Yes, sir. Have you, have you ever done any work with uh, Isaac Hayes? No. I talked about Isaac Hayes one time, though. Okay. <laughs> I love him. He's so fun. And your favorite, too? Of Isaac Hayes? No, anything. Oh, uh. somebody and I think about like what they what they carry. You know what I mean? They carry. And Solomon Northup is a book called uh, is it 14 Years a Slave? What's the 12 it's a book called 12 Years a Slave. If you read that book, no not don't look at the movie. Read the book. If you read the book, Solomon Northup say when he came to the South, he said the first thing they shot them was how much work the woman was doing. Say, man, it was some women that chopped more wood than any of us. <laughs> we was like, damn, this is what women are doing out here? <laughs> and I always like that moment in the book because before it was all the book is like, what happened and what happened. But then his observation, one of his first observations about the condition of being in, enslaved when he wasn't, was this division of labor. So I don't want you to think about that. It don't matter what you are when you start playing the trunk. Especially a high G don't care. A A, you know what you hit? <laughs> they ain't saying, well, it's a woman, let's make sure we, it just, so, and I think also you're going to be nervous. Nervousness is a, is, a, is a part of doing stuff in public. And it's also a part of uh, when you take something serious, you get nervous. And uh, you, you have to embrace the nervousness and face it and realize that it's natural. For you, it's natural. Some people don't get nervous. For them, that's natural. And uh, you're going you're gonna to face it. I'm nervous on a plane. I never have been able to get over it. Damn, I'm going to. You know what I'm saying? 
Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I get on a plane, I can philosophize. But once I get on that plane, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you, I can't sleep. It could be 18 hour flight. Up. <laughs> oh no, everything is cool, I'm alright. <laughs> so what I want you to do is just you hear the play because you can play and you're gonna play. That's what the deal is. Don't look at it like I'm here to play. And when you start playing, the plan speaks for you. And if you gotta improve in your plan like everybody does. You gonna improve. You have to listen to the music to be able to play it. If you don't listen to Cat Anderson, you know Ferguson, is the, so many lead players. If you they, they, to listen to, your lead playing is not gonna be that good. But you're intelligent. You got a lot of spirit. You got personality. You soul for life. There's a lot of stuff I can tell just from standing next. Let's see how you're looking at me. Like, yeah, man, I hate you. Yeah, it's like a confidence, right? You're a lead player. You gotta inform your plan. For all of you on this plan, no matter how sad what your plan is, it doesn't matter because you're here to learn and to get better. And getting better and learning is a part of the natural evolution of life. And just do this. You know, and you you already, a lot of what you need, you got. But that other part, you gotta get. And it's gonna be listening to it. You know what I'm saying? Good luck. We ain't gonna be hard on you. I'm gonna be hard, but the other judges. <laughs> But I, when, I'm, when I'm hard on younger people, it's never destructive. Like my thing is, yes, I'm going to tell you something that's true, but it's not to cut you down and make you feel you shouldn't be doing something. Like we need y'all out here. We need y'all to be serious. Uh, hey, my name is uh, Ryan Berry. I, am, uh, I, got, I play trumpet at a uh, Gaston State Community College. Um, and then my question is, uh, what is like one album that you listened to growing up a bunch that really inspired you? Well, every all of us in that time in the seventies for trumpet players listened to a Freddie Hubbard record called Red Clay. Yeah. But because my daddy was a jazz musician, I always listened to a Cold Train record called Crescent. So Red Clay, Crescent, and of course everybody listened to Miles Davis kind of blue. Okay, but you hear that record, that's one of the greatest records if ever. So that's three good records for you. Crescent, kind of blue. But Red Clay just struck to that's an error thing. I don't, I don't know how you feel about it. <laughs> Whatever you go, well, that makes it easy. <laughs> hey, thank you. Hey, you're right. I see your mustache coming in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see it. I see it. Cody Cofield, I'm a trumpet player from the Gaston State Community College. First of all, say it's a huge pleasure to meet you. My pleasure. My pleasure. And my question, basically, to start off, is like, I'll be playing like a, a backing track, or I'll be playing a tune with the band, and I'll be on the solo. And like, say so the first time we go through it, I'll be reading the chords, and I'll be playing the chords, and it sounds good. I'm playing the right notes. So when I get to a chord, it's got a different note that's not the key. I'll play that. It sounds, it sounds good. It sounds right. And then I might play it the next time around. I'm not even looking at the chords. I have my eyes closed. I'm using my field, and like, I start to realize people. That's what people get entertained by. So like, my question for you is like. What do you think is more important, or is it really just a balance of finding your own sound like, between technicality and like that field? Okay, let's take all the technical technicality out of a person. Boom. Everything you know is technical. You no longer know that. Is your life gonna be okay? No. No. <laughs> no. If you if you if you think about it, you don't know now not to stick your finger in the electric socket. You don't understand, like, you know how, how much technical information you have to have just to survive. Right. You don't know to look when the car is coming. Right. Because you just technically, you don't you ever figure it out, okay? You have to figure things out technically. Intelligence is a powerful tool. Never discard it. That's why lions don't defeat human beings. One lion, <laughs> you're going to have trouble. Put 10 lions and 10 people in something. Them lions are all in zoos. So I don't want you to separate them. Your feeling and your natural ability is a part of your intelligence. Your intelligence is extremely important. So, but if you only access some type of mathematic way to approach musical music, it's mainly spirit. But inside of spirit is mathematics. So you can't separate it. So that's where I'm looking at the why that's behind the building. It's, let me try to get out of what you're saying, looking at the why. 
Yes, theory comes after practice. Like when you teach somebody what a noun is, they've been using nouns. I can't teach you speaking language by, no, no, don't use the gerund. You imagine you see a little kid talking, babbling or something, you start correcting their language. Like a lot of times we teach music backwards. We give you music to read and to look at, and we teach you an unnatural way of playing, and then assess your play. When the natural way of playing is you listen to people and you imitate them, just like you do with language. By the time you took a class in grammar, you were already speaking. So that's kind of what you're saying. I bet you play, I like your vibe about how, you know, that naturalness is important. But don't don't make it battle with your intelligence. Right. Put them both together. Yeah, because I don't want to be stuck at like a low level of music that you said like might be trash, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the trash is reserved for certain things. Trash, trash is not because the music is on a low level. Trash is because the intention is trash. Right. That's very different. And not wrong with a low level of music. Trash means I'm trying to harm you in some kind of way. Because you got some money that I want to get. And I'm willing to, to abuse you because you're a kid or something. You don't know what you're doing for me to make some money. That's trash. It's not because I can't play or chords are wrong or people missing notes. That's not trash. Does that make sense? Good luck.